Well, thank you very much. And I send everyone greetings from beautiful Nairobi. And what an honor it is to speak right after Jane, who is such a, an amazing spokesperson and such a powerful influencer. Um, look, I, I, first of all, I really want to thank you, uh, President Plyer, and of course the FATF, because you're really lifting now with your two reports that you issued on environmental crime, you're lifting the issue of environmental crime and money laundering and, and bringing it to, uh, to greater awareness. And, and I think that's absolutely critical. We at UNEP, we speak about this triple planetary crisis, the climate crisis, which everyone speaks about, uh, and which is intensifying with the deadly extreme weather and all that we see. But we also speak about biodiversity and nature loss crisis, which obviously undermines our very ability to exist, our ability to feed ourselves. And we just heard from Jane the references to zoonosis and pathogen transfer. And we speak about the pollution and waste crisis, which is killing millions of people every year. So climate, biodiversity, and pollution making that triple planetary crisis. Now, environmental crime is not the sole culprit behind these crises, obviously. The whole system is to blame. But environmental crime is a major driver. And if we allow that to continue with the associated money laundering, it will clearly hamper our, grow, our efforts to get on top of these three crises. And the numbers speak for themselves at COP26 in Glasgow that you referenced we saw this commitment to end deforestation by 2030, and we salute that. And, and we understand that forests are a major contributing factor to hold back global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. But we also are very much aware that illegal logging contributes um, about um, between 15 and 30 percent of the timber trade. And if we look at uh, the sustainable development goals, we have um, uh, including that we were going to end hunger and poverty, but we understand that global losses from illegal fishing costs up to $36 billion per year. Now, many uh, conventions regulate hazardous substances, which is also a dimension of environmental crime, from e-waste to banned refrigerant gases, and yet Transactional, uh, transnational gangs and unscrupulous companies, I should say, traffic these banned substances and dump illegal waste, often in the poorest countries, in the poorest neighborhoods of these countries. And health issues follow, environmental issues follow, et cetera. And similarly, obviously, and we am followed by my good colleague, Yvonne, conventions that protect species and protect the ecosystems um, are in place, and yet we see trade in endangered species. So then when we understand, therefore, that major economic and social and, yes, conflict dimension, and peace dimension that such crimes have, that is when we understand the real money, and you have quoted the numbers, as you also mentioned in your report, we understand then that all this illegality is happening outside the realm of government, and Frankly, um, that illegality obviously also deprives governments of potential tax income if there were sustainable uh, timber or whatever sustainable extraction that one might discuss. So environmental crime really deprived people of their latent livelihoods. And we see these unscrupulous um, gangs and other cartels taking advantage of low-income communities to loot their resources, to dump the chemicals, etc. So we very much at UNEP see this as being a dimension to, as I said, peace, to security and to stability. And you mentioned yourselves, as did Jane, the bankrolling of armed groups, um, etc. Now, there are, of course, people standing up to these criminals, and I'm sure some are present here at this event, and we really do admire that commitment. But it's clear that in countries where where people are standing up. These folks need backing, they need funding, and they need a stronger environmental rule of law. Um, so when we look at environmental rule of law, then uh, I think it's important to highlight that that recent recognition of the human right to a clean, healthy, and a sustainable environment is a very important step in the right direction. This was 
uh, in Geneva at the, at the Human Rights uh, Commission just a short while ago. And as we see that momentum grow uh, at the level of state law, um, national law, at the level of international organizations engaging, at the level of communities and citizens calling for their rights, we can uphold this law. These are the kind of elements that UNEP works on when it comes to environmental rule of law. And we understand, of course, that this partnership and others that can help curb these illicit flows could halve, uh, almost halve the 200 billion annual financing gap that Africa, for example, faces to achieve the uh, sustainable development goals if we are able to stop that uh, illegal flow. These, if we're able to stop this illegal flow, it will also obviously enhance uh, Paris uh, and, of course, the new biodiversity agreement that we are in the process of negotiating could be graded aided. Plus, we're in the middle of negotiating a new framework on chemicals, um, and that clearly will also have a dimension here when we talk about illegal dumping. So three things then that we need to do, and it's quite simple. We need to act globally, and part of this conversation today is part of that. Seizures of hazardous substances of wildlife illegally traded on natural resources shows that trafficking often is a transport boundary dimension. We at UNEP, and I mentioned Yvonne, who is the Secretary General of CITES, uh, we're very proud to host a number of multilateral environmental agreements, and they really can help identify activities harmful to the environment. Um, uh, both on the chemical and pollution side and on the dumping side, as well as obviously the illegal trade side. Now, the agreements are global, but we at UNEP then work at the national level to strengthen the national uh, legislative setting. And equally, those who control our borders, they need the skills to stop environmental crime. Here, working in this broad partnership of the Green Customs Initiative, it was established back in 2004 by UNEP, but now today we see everybody is supporting this. And here we're working with partners to help build these skills. For example, in Dominican Republic to roll out a green customs curriculum supporting Dominica with this. So that's on the global level. At the regional level, we at UNEP, we are the home to the regional seas uh, treaties and action plans. In fact, right now, the Barcelona Convention is meeting in Turkey for its COP. That's a Mediterranean Convention um, uh, that deals with the Mediterranean Sea. And here, it, it, there are within these uh, programs, within these conventions, efforts to regulate marine litter and plastic pollution, where we see lots of illegal effluence in a number of, of seas across the world. And through the Regional Enforcement Network for Chemicals and Waste, we're supporting, let's say in Asia, for example, uh, 25 countries to improve their control of illegal trade in chemicals and waste. Um, 600, 865 tons of hazardous chemicals and harmful waste have been seized during this undertaking that UNEP has been supporting. And this begins then also to pull back on the um, environmental crime. So that's a regional dimension that we need to work on and obviously national. And I reference this because it's all about ensuring that the countries have transparency, whistleblower protection, anti-corruption uh, guidelines, and of course, environmental crime in legislative judiciaries and policy making. We work together with our friends at UNODC and across the environmental spectrum to support that, where UNEP holds the environmental rule of law uh, dimension. So colleagues and friends, we really can minimize environmental crime by working together, by showing that dedication and consistency we can minimize it by using the law to protect organizations and individuals who are risking their lives to defend the environment. And we can minimize environmental crime by ensuring that people have real and sustainable economic opportunities and therefore sort of remove that leverage that criminal groups have, which we just heard Jane speak of. So in this context, the work of, the work of FATF is, is really critical and vital in this fight. The fight will be long, it'll be hard, but if we work together, we really can succeed. So with that, let me thank you very much for doing this work and hand it back over to you.
Thank you.